Sawagin, Sahagin, Sahagin, Suwajin, Sir Sea Devils, Sea Devils. This is a review of the original U series of modules for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. The Sinister Secret of Saltmarsh was the first adventure module designed by TSR's UK division back in 1981, following on from the success of their first publication, The Fiend Folio, the only monster manual whose cover is guaranteed to give you nightmares. Ugh. And to this day, it's the sole reason nobody uses Githyanki in their games. You're welcome, my Mind Flayer overlords. You're welcome. Danger at Dunwater followed in 1982, and The Final Enemy in 83, which are direct sequels, forming one continuous storyline throughout the series. U stands for Underwater, and though only the third module actually has any underwater parts, all of them follow a nautical theme and focus heavily on the aquatic races, which are often overlooked in D&D. Their next module, Beyond the Crystal Cave, was actually going to be U4, but as it was completely unrelated, they decided to start a new series. TSR had initially given them the F, or foreign, module code, which was mildly insulting, especially because they were all written in English. The UK office was also the only TSR division outside of North America, so they settled on the UK, or United Kingdom, series instead. Those later modules never really gained any popularity, and eventually TSR UK went pop when its parent company ran out of money. Kind of like what happened to Marvel UK, but that's another story. The U series is set around the little fishing town of Saltmarsh on the coast of the Azure Sea. Inland it's surrounded by stinking marshland as far as the eye can see, with a few days journey to the next town. And what's great is that Saltmarsh is a completely blank slate. You don't get a town map, and it just gives you some suggestions for the main things you might want to include. A tavern, some kind of dock or jetty for fishing boats, and there has to be somewhere for the town council to meet. But that's about it. Most of the adventures are set outside of town, so you can even just make it up as you go when you need to. I really hope they haven't tried to be too prescriptive in the new edition. Having a blank starting town really lets the DM and players make it their own, and it's a strength of the adventure, as it encourages the players to go off exploring rather than playing Fantasy Shopping Simulator. The first module, U1, is all about uncovering the secret of an abandoned mansion overlooking the sea just outside of town. It's often called a Scooby-Doo adventure. There's a mystery to solve, and there's plenty of twists and turns along the way that keep the players guessing. U2 and 3 focus on different locations nearby. U2 is intended to be about diplomacy and forging alliances between the aquatic races of the Azure Sea and the people of Saltmarsh. U3 is a scouting mission, where you gather intel for your new alliance against their shared enemy. They deliberately kept 2 and 3 low-level adventures, so you can't massacre your way through them or use high-level magic to tip the scales in your favour. They reward careful players, and if you go in guns blazing, you're going to get yourselves killed. Saltmarsh, like almost all of the AD&D modules, is part of Greyhawk, which was the default campaign setting at the time. Like most AD&D modules, they didn't really care about the campaign setting, so they just sort of squished Saltmarsh into a corner somewhere out of the way and didn't worry about it too much. It does have a hex reference, but the town is so small, it's not even marked on the official map. Except for the types of aquatic races and a few notes meant for the DM, there really is no indication that these modules are in any way set in Greyhawk. So they can be easily dropped into any homebrew, Forgotten Realms or Eberron campaign. No bother. Probably not Dark Sun though, they've still got a hosepipe ban. Due to the unique way that TSR was run, these modules were actually printed in the US and then had to be shipped back over. So by the time TSR UK's module got here for their big premiere, it had already been released in America. Whoops. These adventures take you through from level 1 up to about level 5, and are meant for how many characters? 5 to 10, 6 to 10, and 8 to 12. Oh dear. Maybe there was a DM shortage, and they were trying to be realistic about the numbers that wanted to play. What am I saying? There's always been a DM shortage. There's an interesting preface to Saltmarsh written by Don Turnbull, the head of TSR UK, talking about the use of English. He talks about the differences in English between the UK and the US when it comes to slang, spelling and meanings. I'm just going to read this bit out because it's worth repeating. This module is written in the English which I use and may therefore appear slightly different in flavour from the language to which the majority of its readers may be accustomed. In one sense I make no apologies for this, it's an English module and it'd be less than representative if I did not carry something of that atmosphere. 
In another sense, I am aware that some readers may therefore find the reading slightly unfamiliar, and if this in any way detracts from their enjoyment of the module, then my apologies are due. Perhaps you will take solace in knowing that UK readers of all the other TSR modules have the same reaction in reverse. A little bit apologetic, quite well mannered. All we're missing is a long queue, a slight drizzle and a cup of tea. A very English module indeed. Despite Don's assurances, the writer, Dave Brown, was clearly very afraid that an American audience wouldn't be able to understand the adventure and put in a lot of explanation for the DM about how to approach the encounters and what to do to get the party back on track if they all went wrong. That makes it sound really railroady, but it's not. The second and third modules give the players set objectives. How they achieve those, or fail to, is entirely up to them. The first adventure is by far the easiest to run as a one-off. You just have to switch out a few of the plot threads and move on. The others could be stripped out and used differently, but you'd be missing out on a lot by doing so. Wizards of the Coast just announced that they'd be redoing the U series for 5th edition, along with a few other nautical and Greyhawk set modules in Ghosts of Saltmarsh. The new adventure compilation is in a similar vein to Tales from the Yawning Portal. They've farmed out the design side to Cobalt Press, and it'll be interesting to see what they've done with them. I'm hoping that they've understood the flow and the central tension that makes these modules special, and haven't made it so easy that players can just force their way through with combat. I'm also 100% certain that they'll Americanise the language. Though being British, I do appreciate the irony of having all the U's removed from the U series. Rest in peace, Armour. We hardly knew ye. If it's any consolation to Don, his plucky module did last 38 years without being remastered, and Saltmarsh is widely regarded as one of the best low-level adventures for AD&D, along with Keep on the Borderlands and Against the Cult of the Reptile God. I'm going to go through each adventure in detail. I thought these were dead modules when I started writing this, so beware spoilers if you're intending on playing the remakes. If you're DMing them, it won't matter anyway. You might also pick up some ideas along the way. And if you're on a fence about buying them, this might convince you to give it a go. You won The Sinister Secret of Saltmarsh. No, honestly, there are massive spoilers in here. If you know all the twists, you can't unknow them, and it'll spoil your fun. Proceed with caution, that's your warning. Like all the old AD&D modules, you get a cover page, which has maps on the inside, and a separate booklet detailing the adventure, NPCs, treasure, and there's even some pre-gen characters in the back. All three of these modules are by Dave Brown, with some help from Don Turnbull and Graham Morris doing the maps. The cover is actually a massive story spoiler in itself, so we'll come back to that later. There's some pointers at the start on creating Saltmarsh, and then it goes straight in with, with the background of the story for the DM. There's a creepy old house four miles from town on a high cliff overlooking the sea, and the locals think it's haunted. The old alchemist that used to live there hasn't been seen for 20 years, but strange lights have been spotted recently at night, and the people are afraid to go near it. There's a nice organic opening to the adventure. You have your players doing things about town, and then they hear about the house from the innkeeper in the local pub. Classic. Some carousing later, a member of the town council will ask you to go and investigate. And you're accompanied by a group of hero-worshipping children part way out from the town. Seems a bit premature, we haven't actually done anything yet, but thanks all the same. You go through the creaky old gate and are in the grounds of the mansion. The mansion is made up of two main levels, ground and first. Do Americans have ground floors, or do you guys start at first? Answers in the comments. That could be a change in the new edition. Let's start a speculation count. Thank you. Also, no use in the remake. Right. The first level is your chance to spook the players and start them guessing as to the sinister secret of the house. The contents of each room can really get the players to second guess themselves. There are mushrooms in one of the fireplace that are perfectly harmless, but you can easily bait your players into being afraid of them. There are also ominous notes in the library, faint tracks on the floor, decrepit broken furniture, and stairs that break when you step on them. There's a load of secret compartments and hidden items to find, so this is perfect for players that like to investigate. The library is full of books by Tensor. See? It's set in Greyhawk. Also, a note about skeletons. Aha! Foreshadowing. The kitchen is infested with centipedes. There's a mouldy scullery and a withdrawing room. Very old school indeed. The ground floor is littered with areas that wail and shout at the party, warning them to leave this place. And it's only right and proper for the DM to ham things up as much as possible. The upstairs is much the same. A few insects and creatures for the party to take out without much difficulty at level 1, and an attic with a bit of a sturge problem. 
There isn't actually a map of the attic, but it's basically the whole roof area. And maybe a cunning party could make their own shortcuts. The house has quite a lot of bedrooms, and in one of them is our first NPC. This is Ned. He tells the characters he's a thief that snuck into the empty house to find somewhere to sleep, and then got knocked out and tied up by persons unknown. Just look at his trustworthy face. I'm sure this is fine. Ned's actually a pretty clever inclusion. Uh, when freed, he'll try and encourage the party to leave or get them to walk into danger or accidents, as he's scared and injured. This is at least true, but not in the way he wants you to believe. He's so suspicious, your players won't be having any of it. I thought this place was haunted, so who tied you up? But that's kind of the point. Ned is a plot device to tell the players that something is up and make them want to investigate even more. The more he tries and stops them, the more suspicious they're supposed to get. Ned's not even a thief, he doesn't even know thieves can't, and he couldn't actually escape from his bonds. Ned's actually an assassin who has been hastily planted in the house by a crooked merchant from Saltmarsh to try and stop the party from finding out what's going on. The merchant fake tied him up before the party got to the house so he could wait for them and try and draw them away. It's an obviously clumsy effort of getting rid of the party, but that's what makes it so good. It's a rushed attempt at a cover-up by a bungling incompetent merchant. And Ned is definitely scared of the party, as he's quite an amateur assassin and will only attack if he thinks he can get away with it, or if he's been rumbled and it's the only way for him to escape. Once the party kills him, he escapes or gets captured, that's about it. But you can easily flesh this bit of story out more and have the party hunt down the merchant in Saltmarsh that sponsored him. I would try and encourage the party to go and do the upstairs bit just for Ned, really. I really hope they haven't edited him out. It's meant to be a super obvious red herring by design. It's not a mistake. Back on the ground floor, you can either go down from the scullery or one of the magic mouths that's been shouting at you to leave this whole time conceals a trap door. If you go through the scullery, you end up in the wine cellar and the module throws up its first old school jerk move to try and kill you. There's a dead body in full plus one plate mail lying right in the middle of the room. He's been dead a couple of weeks, which is suspicious. And his money's been stolen, also suspicious, and no, it wasn't Ned. He's also completely infested with rock grubs, and so are the nearby storage containers. In AD&D, you have to burn them off, or cast Cure Disease, or they'll burrow into you and you're dead in three rounds. Your characters are probably still level one at this point, and clerics don't even get a Cure Disease spell yet. Not cool, game. Not cool. This module is really trying to encourage cautious, careful play, but more modern players used to 5th edition are more likely to get analysis paralysis or felt hard done by in this room. Rock Grubs did get seriously nerfed in 5e. Uh, they have to hit and only kill if they reduce the character down to 0 HP over a couple of rounds. This is definitely a possible change in the new edition. Well, at the very least, they'll have taken out access to plus one plate mail for a level one party. Once the team figure out the body has no money, they might start looking around and find tracks leading off to one of the walls, which is concealing a secret door. You can't miss it, it's next to this giant floppy disk on the map. The party heads through the door and finds a smuggler leaning back on his chair, casually doing some whittling. What? I told you this was a Scooby-Doo adventure. It might even be a bit more Famous Five than Scooby-Doo. The mansion's been taken over as a hideout for a smuggling ring. They fenced the goods with a merchant in town who panicked when he heard the party was going to take a look and sent Ned after them without first warning the smugglers. The haunting sounds and traps on the higher levels were set up to scare the townsfolk away. They apparently mugged a knight on the road and left his corpse to rot in the grub-infested storeroom as a kind of last line of defence. This room's been turned into a bit of a barracks, and it's also full of contraband booze. Hopefully your party managed to kill the smuggler before he gets away and manages to alert his friends. Then they move on to room 22. This is the quarters of the leader of the smuggling ring. Inside you'll find a bullseye lantern and some odd markings on a bit of paper. There's also a few books in here too. A fully illustrated book of erotic poetry worth 10 gold. Yep, <sighs> that's been cut. No wonder they wanted to give us the foreign module code. Honestly, what was TSI UK smoking? A book about tides, a null English dictionary, and a spell book full of first level illusion spells. Why pay for certified contractors when you can magic up some traps yourself? Remember the skeletons mentioned earlier? The next room is where they hang out. The smugglers found them in the house but didn't know what to do with them, so just boarded up the entrance and put a danger sign on it. 
Why the chief of the smugglers wants to sleep next to a room full of feral skeletons, I don't know, but apparently he does. You rededify the skellies and find another body in the next room. It's the alchemist whose house this used to be. And he's died of old age? Again, another fun twist. The people of Saltmarsh may have thought he was the one haunting the place, or had been in hiding, or may have even been the leader of the smugglers. Nope. No, he's just dead of natural causes. No mystery here. This really helps add to the mundane, sort of pretty ordinary explanation behind the sinister haunting. There's some more sweet loot in here too, including another spell book. This is really overpowered and will have been cut. How many cuts are we on now? Several items in this room have also been turned to solid gold. Well, he was an alchemist, that does make sense. Back in the main room, there's another secret passage into a set of natural caverns that open out to the sea. If the first smuggler heard the party, or managed to escape them, the other smugglers will be lying in wait here. Otherwise, they'll just be checking their haul of contraband of silks and brandy? Okay. You can stealth and surprise attack this one, or just go all in. There's some smugglers, a couple of gnolls, and Sanbalet, the master trickster. He's level 4 and everything. That's the smuggler's leader. The gnolls are under his hypnotic control because, and I quote, he has some mastery of non-magical mesmerism. He literally has the hypnotism spell. What? Why does he need non-magical mesmerism? Cut this. Just, just cut. Cut. Defeat or capture the smugglers. And that's about it for part one of U1. Yep, this module was a two-parter. The gnolls are a bit of an odd addition and don't show up again. Uh, this is a bit of a missed opportunity for the series, but you can always feel free to scatter some in later. Maybe you could slot in your own encounters to tie them into the story more, or swap them out entirely for a different race. By the entrance to the sea is a large boat that the smugglers have been using. It's got oars and a little pop-up mast. It's also worth around nine erotic poetry books if you're keeping count. No wonder it's called the Jolly Boat. The party can fill it full of stolen goods and then head back to Saltmarsh to tell the council and that swarm of weird celebrating children what's been going on. Mission complete. The party gets 500 gold each from the town council and can keep any treasure they found. Just don't try and sell the brandy in Saltmarsh though, as it's contraband and you'll have to pay 25% in tax. Tax. Apparently this is a good test of the character's alignment. Maybe the smugglers were the real heroes all along. Ugh. You know it's a proper English module when you get charged VAT on your stolen goods. Americans famously don't like getting taxed, so I rather suspect this will also be missing from the 5e version. Then we move on to part two. You can go on some other adventures in between or jump straight into it. The town council asked the characters for help. They realized the jolly boat from the cave was far too small to cross the sea, so there must be a smuggling ship that's carrying the contraband further out. They arrange for two excise officers to keep a watch on the coast until a ship is spotted. The party are asked to board the ship and deal with the rest of the smugglers. There's a couple of ways you can tackle this one. If the party remembers the lantern and the notes in the leader's quarters, you could try and signal the ship from the mansion. It's literally on the cover. See? Spoilers. They've kept up this tradition in the 5e version too. Just go and look at the alternative cover once we get to U2. Or you can just wait for the ship to turn up. Eventually, it'll arrive to drop off more contraband. But if no one signals back to them from the mansion, they'll start to get suspicious and could leave. So you have to be a little bit quick getting out to them. And they'll probably be ready for you. The two excise officers, Will and Tom Stoutly, will row you out to the ship and help board it. It's not every day you help Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs bust some crims. Another D&D first for you one. Good job, TSR UK. You can try and sneak on board, trick the smugglers into thinking you're part of the group from the mansion, or just charge straight in and attack. If they're not already alerted, the smugglers can be found doing day-to-day -day tasks. My players had an epic and completely one-sided bow fight with the smuggler in the crow's nest. Rest in peace, Ranger Steve. At least you got the Boromir-style death you always wanted. The ship is called the Sea Ghost, and it's actually pretty big with several levels. If you manage to take out the leaders, the rest of the crew may well surrender to try and save themselves. Or you could just burn down the ship and be done with it. But that does mean you won't get any of the treasure, and it's worth a crazy amount of gold. The contraband alone is worth 15,000 GP, though again, the Saltmarsh government wants their 25%. This is another tax I expect to be cut in the new version. Actually, I suspect they'll probably nerf the treasure anyway. 15,000 gold for five level, what, two characters? That's a lot. The magic items and spell scrolls are also pretty OP for this edition, and I'd definitely consider scaling back if running this outside of AD&D. In the captain's cabin, you can find books talking about the lantern signals and Paco the 
bloody parrot returned, sitting in the bosun's cabin, making a nuisance of itself. If your party really like collecting pet, then this is your opportunity to do so. There's also two solid story hooks that lead directly into U2. If you only want to play U1, you can easily take them out and just move on to something else when you're done with the sea ghost. The first hook is a big old cache of weapons that the ship has been transporting, together with a scribbly pictogram that seems to be some sort of purchase order. I do like the classic black and white line art here. It doesn't take itself too seriously either. Who starts cutting a string of sausages while also eating one? Hmm. Bloody pirates. Your next plot hook is room 7. This room is 10 foot square and contains three lizard men, three hammocks, a chest full of money, a table and chairs and something a bit special. It will also, in the event of a melee, contain several party members. So three happy lizard men are chilling out in their hammocks and you come barging in waving your poleaxe around. Thankfully, the module's sensible enough to give a penalty to hit for fighting in such a confined space. Welcome to AD&D, the home of common sense. They also have a pseudo dragon. This is an odd one that many people just delete from the module. It's another free pet for a party member that didn't try and stab it, and a pretty generous reward for a level 2 or 3 character. I'm putting this firmly in the speculative change pile. In my game, the pseudo dragon was the familiar of a lizard folk warlock who could talk through it, and it was actually the dragon that was doing the negotiating. The lizard folk were just there to carry the payment and to protect it. You could even make it part of the illegal goods being smuggled. Why not? The smugglers, it appears, have already been selling weapons to the local lizard folk colony, and these three have been negotiating for more. They also have a prisoner on board. It's a hobbit, and he's naked. Well, it was the 80s. Um, no. No. This is Oceanus, an aquatic elf. Wood elves are a thing, right? So why not aquatic ones? He was sent to spar on the sea ghost by his tribe. He watched them buy a large weapon shipment in another town, but then got captured. If you free him, he's actually a pretty decent NPC follower that will stay with the company for the rest of the series. While many aquatic races pop up in the other modules, Oceanus is the only aquatic elf, and he kind of feels a bit out of place, so when I ran this, I changed him to a triton. I would expect what's he to alter this too, but we did have an unearthed arcana with all sorts of crazy elf sub-races recently, including the sea elf, so they might not. Once you defeat the smugglers and return to shore, the town council impounds the ship and thanks the team for ending the smuggling ring. And that is the sinister secret of Saltmarsh. Let's take a look at the sequel from 1982. You too, Danger at Dunwater. If you won his investigation and combat, you too represents the social pillar of play. If you have a lizard folk PC out of Volos, they'll definitely shine here, as well as any charismatic or face characters in your group. The module begins with a decent recap for you one. This is useful as it means you didn't need both adventures on the table if you needed to double check anything. The key NPCs from before, like Oceanus, have their stats repeated in the back too, which is a nice touch. This will be cut in the 5e version because it's all in one book, but having a succinct version of events can still be really helpful for a DM. The character count has gone up to 6 to 10. No obvious explanation as to why. Anyway, the Saltmarsh Town Council calls on the adventurers for aid once again. Members of a local lizard folk tribe are being spotted closer to Saltmarsh than ever before, having moved back into their old stronghold in Dunwater. They always used to stay away from the humans, but finding out the lizards are buying up huge quantities of weapons from the smugglers has got the Town Council worried. They're afraid the lizard folk are planning for an all-out invasion of Saltmarsh. They ask you to go and see them and find out what's going on, and possibly negotiate on their behalf to prevent the situation from escalating. The Stoutly brothers and Oceanus, if still alive, will tag along too. They'll also offer the use of a ship to cross the Azure Sea over to Dunwater. No, not the Sea Ghost. That's still impounded. Typical lawful good counsel. You get another ship, basically exactly the same, except it doesn't actually get a name. Maybe TSA UK thought everyone would have sunk it in the previous module. I don't know. Retcon please, what's he? You have two possible routes to get there. The Seaborn one, where you just sail straight over to Dunwater, and the Land one, where you trudge through miles and miles of marshland full of bollywugs and giant toads that all try to eat you. Don't even bother prepping this bit. Your players will always go by water, trust me. The bollywugs don't even count as a faction for some reason, despite living directly between Saltmarsh and the lizard folk. Once again, bollywugs get no love. It's a missed opportunity, really. You get the party to the colony, let the negotiations begin. There are three possible options here. One, the straight road. Your players say, take me to your leader. 
and speed run it all in one session. You can actually have this happen by accident. If the players enter by area 49, they'll get captured and taken straight to the chief, and can then find out exactly what's going on. Option 2. The Picard Maneuver. The party carefully tread their way through the world of lizard folk politics. They learn about the culture, they persuade, manipulate and diplomatize the different factions and come away with everything by the kitchen sink. This is how the model intends your players to do it. Or Option 3. The Anakin. Your characters genocide their way through an entire tribe of lizard folk, slaughtering younglings, hatchlings, eggs and the elderly as they go. Oh dear. Your players move through the stronghold and each area has the lizard folk in various domestic scenes. Most of it's shown in the artwork, which is which is kind of hilarious. Special mention to the two lizard folk children playing in the throne room, who on meeting the party will follow them around the entire lair, unless you tell them off. Not all of lizard kind is united though. There are several different factions to interact with who all have separate agendas. Even in politics, the lizard folk are cold blooded. The sub chief is ambitious and the elder minister doesn't approve of the current chief's foreign policy. The party could side with the current leader or topple them. It's kind of up to them really. Eventually you find out that there are other races here too and they've come here at the lizard chief's request to form an alliance. Being as this is AD&D, the races all have ridiculous and unpronounceable names. The Coalinth who don't want to take sides and are getting ready to leave. Uh, the Lokatha who ride around on electric eels and want to side with the lizard men. And a group of mermen. The last time I ran these modules I used mer people as Lokatha and tritons in place of mermen. Or the other way around. As I'd already made Oceanus a triton rather than an aquatic elf, uh, this seemed to be a pretty easy decision to make. For the Koa length, I went with uh, Kua Toa, you know, the sardine head people, but you could easily use Mero or even Sea Spawn out of Volos. I expect the races to be updated for 5th edition too. Speculation count, please. Thank you. In area 43A, you find a Sahagin, Sahag, whatever, rotting in the cells. He pretends to be a Triton if the party speak to him and tries to convince them all of the lizards are evil. If you brought Oceanus with you, he won't be having any of it and cuts the guy's head off on the spot. Well, lad. There's also a dead elven thief in the lumber room. Yes, the lizard folk have a room entirely dedicated to lumber. In my game, I linked this thief to the rock grub knight from U1 and the main NPC coming up in U3. I had a you weren't the first team we sent theme running around in the background and used it to start off another adventure when we were done on the U series. This isn't an official bit in the modules, but it's an idea for you. As the players work their way through the stronghold, they'll figure out what's been going on. The lizard folk have been gathering weapons and allies, not to attack salt marsh, but to protect themselves. They're in Dunwater because they've been booted out of their lair further down the coast by an army of sea devils. The Sahagin, with help from their evil sea god, raised the water level and then attacked without warning. The lizard folk think that once the lair has been secured and they've built up their forces, they'll start staging attacks on everyone else living along this part of the sea. The party can then offer to join the alliance too, after all Salt Marsh could be next, and this leads on to the events of U3, the final enemy. Now is the time to look at the alternative cover for Ghosts of Salt Marsh. Nice spoiler, Watsy. Repent, sinners! If your group went round doing the murdering before finding out the truth, the module's got a few ways for the DM to get things back on track. Mecha Lizard Man here will let you off for purging all his friends and family if you kill a bloody great crocodile. Someone's easily impressed. A lot of DMs like to run this encounter anyway, just to give the module a bit more combat. It also makes sense for the party to try and prove themselves to the lizard folk and show that they're worthy allies, not just, you know, squishy prey. If your party killed everyone, and I mean everyone, then a few days later a group of mermen will visit the town council in Saltmarsh and explain the threat of the sea devils. Apparently they've also just massacred a tribe of lizard folk in Dunwater. Uh, yeah, that, that sounds terrible. Um, it's a shame we weren't there, we might have been able to help. Um, yeah. You three, the final enemy. This title is um, lazy, but straight to the point. Nice maps again, but there's something fishy about these two. Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, I'll see myself out. This module starts out with another decent recap chapter. Oh, I see Craftnix has set up shop in Saltmarsh, 
Very enterprising, very enterprising. Though they will have redone all the artwork for Ghosts, so I'm afraid you've been cut, old chap. Never mind. The newfound alliance are trying to build up their forces to attack the Sahagin lair, but they also need more intel, so they send the party on a recon mission. The reward the party get and the outcome of the whole situation depend on what they manage to find out and report back. There are four objectives. Determine the strength of the enemy force, locate the barracks and guard posts, find any traps or defences, and maybe even disable them, and find out when the Sea Devil Army will be ready to attack. Page 43 has a great breakdown for the DM, and you can be really flexible about what counts as a success. Once again, the party can take a sea or land route to the other side of the Hall Marshes, where the Sahagin have taken over the Lizardfolk's old lair. Salt Marsh will give them six men, including Tom and Will Stoutly, and the lizard folk will provide 14 warriors to assist the party. These guys will help out with random octopus attacks on the way and secure the entrance. The characters and poor Oceanus will have to do all of the rest, unless they give them all red shirts, of course. Hmm. If you go by ship and park it close enough, park? Uh, anchor. Anchor it close enough. The Sea Devil guards will call for backup and a large force will come out from an underwater entrance to chase and try and attack the ship. You can use this and the NPCs as a distraction as you sneak inside. On the inside of the adventure are some useful area maps. See? We're still in Greyhawk. And these two handouts. Could this be the best D&D map ever made? Yes. Yes it is. Those happy lizard children have drawn the party a nice map of their former home to help them out. It's even got little stick lizards on it. Despite the childish drawing, this is actually a pretty accurate map and is a decent reward for completing U2 on friendly terms with the lizard folk. In some ways, this lair is a kind of odd mirror of U2. The sea devils are just going around their day-to-day -day business, except they're massively evil and you get attacked on sight if the party doesn't manage to sneak around. Why is there an entire paragraph on seaweed beds? Too much information, TSR. Level 1 is sparsely populated, so it should be no trouble for the players to sneak around or just take out the isolated groups of guards and do some exploring. The armoury is pretty well stocked and together with the empty quarters will give a massive hint that there's a lot of enemies here. I haven't counted up exact numbers in the module, but we're talking at least 120? And that doesn't include eggs or wandering bands of Sahagin that may or may not come up behind the party. Then we come to area 13, the slave pens. The Sea Devils have been taking slaves and they've been working them to death to remodel the lair so it's more to their liking, including channeling in seawater on the lower levels. A couple of lizard folk, there's a few orcs, a hobgoblin, and one of them is a human. He's dying and his mind is broken, but the party can get some vital info before he dies. And it's a shame he's dying because he's a level 5 wizard. A wizard called Elmo. He came here with another adventuring party, but they were attacked and he was the sole survivor. Elmo tells you exactly what's been going on and kind of gives you the password to his wand of polymorphing, which he doesn't actually have on him, but it's nice to tell you all the same. Uh, then he drops dead. Vengeance for Elmo! I honestly never thought I'd say that today, but there you go. Weirdly, the module lists ways to save Elmo, but then makes it clear a party of this level wouldn't have access to such things. You literally need wish heal and access to greater restoration. At most, your party will be level 4 at this point, so why is this in here? If you do manage to save him, somehow, which they've already told you is basically impossible, he actually has more information on the other members of his team and will help fight once he gets back his wand and spellbook from what I'm calling the Room of Many Nice Things. Room 18. Nerfed in the remake? Oh yes. Hell, I nerfed it. And I normally love giving away magic items, but there you go. This is where the Sea Devils took all of the gear Elmo's party were carrying. And they had a lot of cool stuff on them. Spellbooks, magic weapons, underwater items, potions. This is a subtle hint at how tough the Sea Devils are and why the party shouldn't mess with them in open combat. The other team were super tooled up and higher level and they still got killed. They even had a luck blade and used up all the wishes. As I said earlier, at this point I like to link up Elmo's story to the knight in U1 and the elven thief in U2, but, but that's up to you. Once we've finished with level 1, we descend down some stairs, and then we find out that the lower two floors have been completely flooded, and the sea devils have already started moving in. This puts the characters at a major disadvantage, and maybe was another measure from TSR to discourage combat? 
I'm not sure really. Many of the DMs I've spoken to that have run U3 think this is just too great of a handicap. Either they only submerge a few key rooms like the temple, or have level 2 completely clear with a few feet of water starting to slosh around level 3 instead. This can work out pretty well and it also gives the characters a chance to start sabotaging or delaying the flooding process. I'd like to see this as an option in the new release. In the AD&D edition, they had to include all sorts of magic items, potions and scrolls upon level 1 to make sure that it was possible for the party to traverse the rest of the dungeon. As there were so many other loot drops in throughout the U series, it's not quite as obvious that they've done it. In 5th edition in general, you reward players with fewer magic items and your 5e party isn't getting access to water breathing until level 5 or polymorph at, what, 7? Okay, you have Alter Self, Potions and a Triton character would be a good workaround, but I want to see how the new designers have approached this part so it's not too contrived or immersion breaking. Oh, how convenient, we can suddenly breathe underwater. Hmm, yeah. If you Skyrim your way around level 2, you'll end up with a ridiculous amount of loot. No one needs that many nets, gems and underwater crossbows. Wait, what am I saying? This is Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, of course they do. It doesn't take a genius to put all of the loot in the nets and then have the fighter pull everything along back to the surface. Sound plays a really big part in this module. Raised voices, fighting and sounds of construction carry a long way and can be a source of info for the players and a cause to raise the alarm for the Sahagin. Each section of the module explains to the DM if the characters will be heard and where the reinforcements will come from. They have a cave shark and they are using it to sacrifice hatchlings in the temple. Well, that'll save us some effort. Whose side are you on, Shark? The Sea Devils have overwhelming numbers and the advantage of being in the natural element for two-thirds of the dungeon. TSI UK were being a bit cruel here. They definitely wanted you to stealth this mission, but if you have a Slayer-type player in your group, wait for their eyes to bulge out when you describe the inhabitants of Room 42. The Throne Room. One High Priestess, six to eight elite guards, one chieftain, and... The evil baron. Dum dum dum. The Sahagin baron is nine feet tall, has a plus one trident, six hit dice, and, and, has four arms. All of which can wield weapons, and he can also make two attacks with his legs. So he can do five to seven attacks per round. Good luck, level three noobs. One of the guards is on trial, and the characters can witness the scene from a side entrance without being spotted. Do not engage. If any of them raise the alarm, they'll summon the entire army. Then again, we are assuming that all of your limbs haven't been pulled off already by the time the reinforcements get there. This part of the module is actually the origin for the Sagan Baron and Priestess in the 5e Monster Manual. There are plenty of other rooms on this level, with lots of different scenes going on. The Baroness is in her quarters telling someone off. Oh, and make sure to pick up some Rapture Weed while you're rifling around. To seagoing species, it's kind of like alcohol. To land-dwelling races, it's a massively deadly narcotic that your character will become highly and aggressively addicted to, and it'll also kill them within three months. Hmm, I'm sensing another 5e nerf coming. Speculation count away! Level 3 is pretty rammed full of stuff too. The Sea Devils have even built a gladiatorial arena to pit their captives against each other. And there's two other NPCs you can rescue, this time aquatic races, and we finish up with Area 60, the Sea Cave. This is where Elmo's party entered the lair, which was a mistake because there are 64 Sahagin warriors sleeping in here. They've been waiting for their barracks to be flooded back on level 1. Most of them are asleep, but there are a fair few of guards that aren't. Uh, they've also closed the gate. It'll need to be open with the mechanism on this side to get out, and that's probably going to wake everyone up. So be ready to... Swim? Run? Run, swim. Run, swim. Oh, or backtrack your way through the two levels back to the front entrance. Once the party has gathered as much information as they can, or are forced to retreat, they return to Saltmarsh. If the ship and your NPCs acted as a distraction earlier, they'll have managed to fight off the patrol, and will be waiting to give you a lift back. Once in Saltmarsh, the party will tell the leaders of the Alliance what they've found out. The town council thanks the group for their efforts, and hands them some more cash money. Yeah! The battle itself takes place two weeks later, and with the information gleaned by the party, the Alliance of Races storm the lair and wipe out the Sea Devil threat forever. The water level recedes, and the lizard folk leave Dunwater and return home. Oceanus pieces out too, assuming he's survived since EU1. Having the main assault take place off screen without the party getting to take part may seem to be anticlimactic, but it also shows that this is a real breathing world 
where time doesn't stop if the characters aren't there. The party's intervention definitely tipped the balance in the war, but the module is trying to emphasise that in this world, it's not really realistic for a few level 3 heroes to wipe out a whole army in their underwater stronghold. An army that has just defeated a whole tribe of lizard folk and a higher level party of NPC adventurers. Yes, if you want them to be at the battle, you can definitely come up with some epic combat encounters, but you'll be kind of missing the point of the U series. It's about exploration, interaction and social encounters. It encourages thoughtful play and rewards players for putting together the clues and discovering the secrets of salt marsh as they go. It's not really about beating every monster with a stick until they fall over. That's partly why it's designed for such low level characters, to stop the players mowing their way through U2 and U3 without batting an eyelid. At the time this definitely set these modules apart, and is why they still remain a popular adventure nearly 40 years later. It's also because of the crazy amount of loot. Honestly, there are more magic items in these three little books than Horde of the Dragon Queen and Rise of Tiamat combined. Right, that's your lot, the original U series adventures from TSR Hobbies UK. Well done if you managed to stick it out for the whole video. Original copies are still fairly common in the wild, and they're also available for download on the DMs Guild. Ghosts of Saltmarsh will soon update these modules for 5e, along with some other nautical type adventures from D&D past. I'm glad Watsi are remaking it for a new generation of players to enjoy, though I'm sure some of the unique British charm of the originals might get lost in translation. How many changes did I speculate have been made in the new edition? Nice. We'll have to wait to see if I was right. Have you ever played the U series? What do you think about nautical or underwater adventures in role playing games? Let me know downstairs. Thanks for watching. Take a rummage in the description box for more content on this topic and subscribe for more plus one wisdom. See you next time.